Good morning. We would like to welcome you to. That may help a little bit. We'd like to welcome you to worship with us this morning at First Baptist Burnsville. If you're here in person or if you are tuning in via Facebook and online, there's a few announcements that I'll draw your attention to on the back of the worship guide. The first being the quarterly business meeting is today after our worship service in the fellowship hall. Uh, please make plans to attend. Next Wednesday, the 15th, there is a Meet Us at the Manger follow-up meeting. This is to talk about what we liked, what went well with our recent nativity display. If you haven't seen that, I would encourage you to go on Facebook and see the pictures. It was incredible to see this space filled with different representations of the Holy Family. And if you would like to be part of that discussion, please be here at 4 next Wednesday. And then there's two events coming up. Saturday the 18th is a church cleanup day. Um, we'll kind of spruce up our church grounds and our buildings, sweeping things away that have collected dust, things that have taken up space that we no longer need to hold on to. And then the 19th on Sunday, right after service, we'll move that time to the garden and begin preparing the soil, taking out soil that is no longer useful and replacing it with soil that can feed plants so that we can then share that harvest with our community. And then Ash Wednesday, February 22nd, will be at 7 o'clock. You know, this image of cleaning out and preparing is one that Lent invites us to explore. And I would encourage you to think over these next few days as you come to church to clean out our physical space, as you come to the garden to clean out the dirt so that things can grow and give life, what might we need to clean out in our lives before Ash Wednesday when we begin the journey once again? Whatever brought you to worship this morning, whatever it is that you're cleaning out in your life right now, I hope that you find what you're looking for. Take a deep breath. Let us join together in worship. Good morning. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship printed in your bulletin. You could have stayed in bed. You could be eating breakfast out. To be in this place with our siblings, reflecting on God's love for the world. You could give a cold shoulder to your neighbors. You could warm yourself in front of the fireplace. We have chosen to be God. Love. You could be chasing after the world's idols. You could be listening to television's talking heads. Please pray with me. O oh, Father in heaven, everlasting God, maker of all we see, all we feel, of both time and space, we're grateful for your promise that when two or more are gathered, you are there among them. We thank you for the privilege to gather in your holy presence once more with this community. O oh, Lord, we ask that you would bless our worship today. We pray that you would help us drop the the drape of closed-mindedness, of anxiety, 
of fear. Instead, instead have a yearning and an open heart, one that thirsts for your word. Be with us as we worship today. Fill us with wisdom to understand your will. And let us experience the peace that each believer possesses in you. With gratitude, these and so much more we ask in the holy name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Um, there is a song in your bulletin, The Peace That We Share. Um, notice that the refrain is in bold and that we will sing the refrain after every verse. Won't you please stand? i 
please pray with me. We gather as peculiar people. We march to the beat of a different drum. Your ways are not our ways, but yet we strive to be like you. So we take and receive offerings because we believe and trust there's enough. We believe we are blessed. The heat is on. We drove a car to church. There's a nice warm home waiting for us. There's food in the pantry and in the refrigerator. So we gather in this place to give thanks to you and share to be generous because that's who we think and believe you are. So shall we. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. We'll continue in our service with the reading of the word. <clears throat> Today's reading comes from Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 37. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court, and anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary um, who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. 
Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Uh, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to go into hell. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you, anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your, ha by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. For all you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. These words of Jesus, such a contrast from what we've heard 
over the last few weeks. Jesus moving from reminding his followers that they are salt and light to this formula that you just heard, but I say unto you. It has often led people to wonder if Jesus was, was he having a bad day? Of course, the other hurdle is that these words of Jesus, well, they have to be translated by you and me. And we all know what some people do with the words of Jesus. People have used them to serve as a weapon to keep some people down. A lot of people, of course, that have gone through the challenges and the pain of divorce have heard these words of Jesus used against them to make them feel as if they are second-class citizens. But I see this text a little differently. Jesus takes the law and he takes it a step further. For me, it wasn't that God just dropped the law out of the sky. For me, it was more of God meeting people where they were. And if people were going to make it, if people were going to survive as community, you couldn't have total chaos. There had to be some parameters. And the law gave people a chance because it gave them parameters. But the law can only go so far. The law is limited. You know, the law will never bring about real transformational change. It may provide parameters, but it can never change a person's heart. Right? The law can never change a person's heart. Law is limited in its capacity to bring about transformational change. While most of us may not really like what Jesus is saying, mainly because he's talking about sin, missing the mark. We may not like what Jesus is saying because Jesus doesn't lower the bar. He raises the bar. I love what Barbara Brown Taylor once wrote about sin. She writes, the word sin has gone out of style in the last half century or so. She says that she had loving parents who helped her learn about the kind of behavior they wanted her to have without using the word sin. Instead, they set limits. They helped her to understand that there were certain things that would bring them closer together as a family, such as telling the truth, helping around the house, being a good big sister to her younger siblings. And there were certain things that would push her parents away, such as trashing her room, breaking things, and smoking cigarettes. But, she writes, other children I knew were not so lucky. They lived with people who believed you could beat the sin out of a child. 
And they spent most of their time in hell. In those spiritually battered souls. And if, they, if those battered souls had any appetite for God left when they grew up, then they had an enormous amount of work to do before they could conceive of anything close to a loving judge. I thought about in this limited time, what is it that we really need to talk about? These words of Jesus, what is it that we need to talk about? I couldn't help but wonder about this thing that seems to be running rampant in our culture called anger. I mean, we've all seen it, haven't we? Lately, we've seen it more than we would like to see anger, it seems. Dallas Willard once wrote, he said, we may become an angry person and any incident can evoke from us a torrent of rage that is kept in constant readiness. Have you ever lived in a moment like this where anger seems to be just fashionable? It just seems fashionable. I had a visit recently to the VA it's one of the perks of having served the nation is I get VA benefits, which I'm grateful for. And I had an eye exam and on the wall where the doctor helps treat patients was a note on the wall. I was grateful because I could read it, first of all. But the note said this, I wear my mask to protect you. Your mask will protect me. Let's love our neighbor and wear a mask. So as I was sitting there, I said something to the doctor about the note. I said, that's a wonderful example. In this moment, whatever it is we're living in, a good example of how we love our neighbor. But it seemed to me that early on in the pandemic, it was so obvious how little regard there was for neighbor. I remember coming home in the early moments of the pandemic and it was so somewhat frustrating. There was a little girl outside the grocery store. I thought, what a terrible job that must be, handing out masks. Being a teenager, and as I went into Engels, I noticed some people sort of swatting away the young teenager's attempt. I remember how frustrating it was that surely we could do better, love our neighbor. There's a children's book that is often read around our place entitled Out of a Jar by Deborah Massaro. The book is all about what to do with feelings, to, 
to paraphrase the book, is simply this. The entire book is about this, is that we need to be courageous enough to feel our feelings, to share them, to look them in the eye, give them a hug, and then let them go. Anger in itself is, well, it's a God-given emotion. And nowhere in Scripture are we told that we should never be angry. It's a human emotion that we all have. The greater questions are what makes us angry? And why are we so angry? And what should we do with our anger? And how can we release our anger so that we don't let the sun go down on our anger? In other words, you don't want to take anger and put it on the stove and let it just simmer. It's just not healthy to keep anger on the burner where it just keeps slowly boiling. You see, what matters is what we do with anger. How we release our anger. While anger and forgiveness aren't exactly the same thing, we could certainly take notes about how to handle it. As Anne Lamont once said, is not forgiving is like drinking rat poison and then waiting for the rat to die. <laughs> you know, you could say the same thing about anger to a certain extent. Anger can be fun. Let's think about that. Anger can be fun. I mean, why else would it be so fashionable? If it wasn't fun, there wouldn't be so many people angry. The Presbyterian writer Frederick Breitner once said, of the seven deadly sins, anger is possibly the most fun. To lick your wounds, to smack your lips, over grievances long past, to roll over your tongue the prospect of bitter confrontation still to come, to savor the last toothsome morsel, morsel of both the pain you are given and the pain you are given back. In many ways, he writes, it's a feast for a king. The chief drawback is that what you are wolfing down is yourself. The skeleton at the feast is you. Jesus raises the bar. And why does he raise the bar? See, I think this whole text is about relationships. It's about living in community together. And Jesus raises the bar. He keeps raising the bar because relationships matter. You know, you can keep the law. You can be a wonderful law keeper. And then you can murder people with words. 
hearts. Right? You can rip people apart at the seams with words. One of the greatest lies ever told was that sticks and stones would break our bones, but words would never hurt us. It really helps us develop community if we approach it with a great deal. There's two things that's important for community building. Empathy and humility. Empathy and humility. Empathy and humility. And the only people who don't need empathy are perfect people. If you're perfect, you don't have to have empathy. How many people do you know that are perfect? I just recently saw a successful act actor. He was recently asked, what would you say to people who are just getting in the business? about how to be successful. And as he said them, I grabbed my pen and wrote them down. He said, well, I would say to them just three things. Be polite. Be on time. Just be kind to people. And after I put my pen down, I thought, I think that's what Jesus is saying. Be polite. Show up. And be kind to people. You see, the problem with anger or lust or any of the seven deadly sins is this. They are a sign that we have forgotten who we are and whose we are. We have forgotten that everything we believe is built on the twin foundations of a loving God and loving neighbor as ourselves. We've fallen into the deadly habit. Barbara Brown Taylor would say of treating other people as someone we can use, someone that we can fix, someone that we can save, enroll, convince, or control. instead of someone who can help spring us from the prison of ourselves. My mother was the most influential person in my life. The matriarch of our home. She made sure that she went to church and that we went with her. And I had the privilege of watching my mother live out her faith. She wasn't a preachy woman. She wasn't a preachy woman. But she would say to me over and over and over again that going to church doesn't matter. If it doesn't help you treat someone kindly, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you go to church or live, the, live by a law if you can't treat people with a sense of love and dignity. Isn't that the core of our nation? That this nation was built on the foundation that we are all created equal. We're all 
created equal. But you got to live it. That's what matters. So what's this place for here? Why do we sit underneath a steeple? Every Sunday. Well, I think the best thing that happens in a space like this one is that when we gather, that together we practice the art of letting go. You know, we all have some stuff we need to let go of. Now, some of us may have more than others. But we all have stuff to let go of. I'm not foolish to believe that I know what you need to let go of. I want to be humble enough to admit to you that I've got stuff to let go of. The question for all of us today is, what is it that you need to release today? And isn't that the question that Jesus was really raising? Okay, you've got these laws, but what's in your heart? Isn't Jesus really saying in so many ways, just remember who and whose you are. And if we will allow love to shape us and mold us, then we'll stand a chance at keeping the commandments. Because the commandments have gotten down deep. They have gotten beyond the surface and they have made their way into a heart. And that's the only way you can keep them. So here we are two days before Valentine's Day. Isn't this a wonderful time for us to examine our own heart? I think it's a perfect day, and I hope you'll join me. Won't you please stand and turn in your hymnal to hymn number 283, and let us sing, Take My Life and Let It Be Consecrated.
pray with me, please. While your words <clears throat> challenge us, O oh Lord, you call us into the deeper waters of what it means to be loved and to be loving. And how we treat other people is all the proof the world will ever need to know who exactly we really are. Help us to be kind, polite, and loving so that the world may come to know you. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.